You're listening to Business Talk Radio, where we take business to the next level. Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline connects you with experts from all over the world to help you take charge of your career, your business, and your life. Wrap along with us. Visit drjacqueline.com to learn how to become a guest or a sponsor. And now, the doctor is in. Hello and welcome. This is Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline, the underdog show. And my co-host, Ben Chai, is off today. I am your host, executive producer, director, and broadcast engineer. And our show is all about giving people a platform to share their stories of how they've overcome adversity. My guest today is joining us from Canada. Her name is Becky. Hello, Becky. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Hi, it's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. You look lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Becky, I think that your background is truly amazing. Nobody would have any idea with all that you've accomplished, what you have been through. But you are a creative. You're an empath. You've written poetry and lyrics. And I think that a lot of what you've accomplished has probably helped to dissipate some of the pain that you've gone through. You also do a, a lot of work at a place called St. Mary's. And uh, we, I know that has something to do with your story. Uh, the great news is that my co-host who is off is actually here. So let's bring him on, oh, Mr. Ben Chai. There he is. Hi. So, hey. hi. Nice you, to see you. Yeah, you know, you know what it is, Dr. Jacqueline? I have a link from you for Monday, from Wednesday and Thursday. I think I, I was in the Thursday one, so that's probably what's happening. Uh, yeah. Okay, it can happen with those links. We're glad that you're here. And I just was introducing Becky, and uh, Becky is an empath, and she's a creative, and she's overcome a lot of struggle in her life, and her create creative outlets have enabled her to dissipate and emitterate some of the pain that she's had. So oh, I, I'd love I for you. I had a look at your LinkedIn, Becky, actually. And uh, yeah. noticed you were a volunteer at the Rape Crisis uh, Center as well. Um, yeah, in, I was there for a couple of years. Ottawa, yeah. was it? Or Quebec? Uh, I, no, no, I no, think. in Ottawa, yeah. In, yeah. So, so I have actually had a, a, a look. And actually, last week, Becky, we did uh, have an empath who was on the show and didn't know she was an empath, like, you know, in her childhood. So she had, was picking up all these emotions, but hadn't realized it. And people were thinking she's a bit crazy and stuff. I'm, I can I'm, relate. <laughs> yes, I was, I, I was thinking you might be able to relate to that. So that kind of depreciated her, her self-worth because people thought maybe she was crazy or something. So she shut down internally in expressing her emotions and, and just focused on studies, but never really shared her true self. Is it, is I can definitely relate. Absolutely. Um, I was never accused of being crazy, not to my face anyway. Um, but uh, I certainly was bullied. I was certainly, um, you know, made me feel like I was different. I was often pegged as over dramatic and and uh, that kind of stuff. And it, it, it didn't it didn't help with any self esteem or self worth issues I already had. So. Yeah. yeah. And and as a child, as we know, we already have tons of self. Uh, esteem issues and to have that on top I'm, I'm really sorry sorry dr j you look great dr j by the way <laughs> thank you it, it's actually a, a formal gown it goes all the way to the floor yes oh, oh. wow <laughs> so thank you you look quite nice yourself um Becky, we were talking a little bit before the show and uh, you've survived through a lot and you shared some of it with me. Where would you like to begin telling us about your journey? Um, well, I mean, my, my main way of putting myself out there is through my art. So, uh, you know, I'd love to share that a bit. I've, I've started singing at a very young age. Um, it's, it's, it's been in my family. My, my mom and dad are both very talented and, and creative in their own right. Um, my mom was a piano teacher and, and just loves music and loved musical theater. And um, my dad, um, to this day, is an amazing musician. Uh, he, you know, if he had been able to, for whatever reason, 
go down to Laurel Canyon in the 60s or 70s, I really honestly think he would have become one of the greats um, and would be continuing on that journey as a producer in some form. But um, so I come by it honestly. Um, but as much as I loved it and all that sort of thing, my first real introduction was, I think I was about eight or nine, a um, professional tour of the musical Les, Les Miserables was uh, coming to Ottawa and my mom thought it would be fun to do an audition as they were having an open call audition for the part of young Cosette. And so she taught us a song, my sisters and I, I have two sisters, and um, we went to the audition, it was really fun. And uh, I can't remember if it was in the final two or three, but I got into the finals and somebody uh, that was part of the, the professional group I remember my mom telling me, took her aside and told her, you know, she's she's got a real gift for this. If she wanted to do it, she could probably do very well. And from that moment on, you know, my mom asked, hey, do you want to do this? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and so that was my first jump into it. And I started doing musical theater in my local city of Ottawa. And, um, and then I started doing local events, so singing at fundraisers and um, um, ceremonial events. I, you know, I would sing at the mayor's birthday party and I would sing the anthem at the Ottawa Senators games and stuff like that. It was really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of where it started. And then it just, it, it's changed dramatically over the years. Um, uh, I started getting into to television when I was younger as well. I was on a couple of episodes of a popular TV show for kids called Goosebumps. And um, I even was in a movie with Burt Reynolds and Ryan Gosling way before he was the Ryan Gosling uh, when I was about 13 or so. And, uh, you know, so a lot of people thought like, wow, she's going places. But unfortunately, um, and this is a big reason, a big part of my platform as well. Um, I was raped when I was 13 years old. It was a very traumatic event and I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to process it. I kept it a secret. In fact, spent a long time convincing myself that it wasn't rape and that he did it because he loved me and he couldn't help himself and you know I must have taken part in some way to make him think that I too wanted it and stuff and and so um unfortunately all the bullying and issues I'd had before because I already felt different from the reasons Ben brought up being an empath and having very deep and strong emotions um but uh, also because I was in music and television you know, my peers didn't treat me very well a lot of the time. And so uh, it all just contributed to a very, very deep plummet into anger and self-hatred and no self-worth. And um, from there, my journey just, it was not good. I uh, I still tried to stay in music. I, um, you know, my I tried at one point to convince my parents that I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but thankfully, in a good way, they were very much like, no, 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 you're really good at this. I think you could do it. I think you do love it. Don't, you know, don't um, hold yourself back. And so I decided, well, I don't want to be the center of attention anymore. I wasn't comfortable with that. So why don't we make a band? And so we did. <laughs> my brother was the lead guitarist and a singer. My older sister was the keyboardist and a singer. I played bass and was a singer. And my father was the rhythm guitarist. My mother managed us and we had a friend, a dear friend playing drums and um, we started playing all over the city, really released a few albums. We had a music video on um, a popular Canadian um, um, music channel called Much Music. And but the struggle was also we, we weren't able to go anywhere with it. We weren't able to you know, go on tour and these kinds of things. We had lots of things hindering and challenging us for that. Um, by the time I would think I was 18, I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to do those things. I want to go on tour. I want to, you know, explore this further. And so I, I left the band, which was not easy to do when you're in a band with your family. Um, and, um, yeah. And then just from there, um, unfortunately I didn't know how to navigate the world. I didn't know how to make a go at it. I didn't feel loved and supported, um, you know, because it was a family band. There was a lot of anger around it, which is all fair. There's no hard feelings. There's no, you know, animosity between any of us. I'm very close with all of my family members. Um, but at this point, I don't even know if they knew that I had been raped. I hadn't really talked about it, but I was still a very angry, um, not even very pleasant <laughs> person. And um, so even though I had all these dreams and aspirations, I had no idea how to go about them. So I started making very poor choices. I didn't continue education. 
I, um, I, I, I chose very poor partners to, to align myself with in terms of um, boyfriends and, and that stuff. Most of them were abusive and, and um, going through their own issues that just made it toxic and awful for us to be together. And uh, I, I got pregnant at, at 19 years of age, just after my 18th birthday, a couple months. And um, I struggled with the, the idea of becoming a parent only in the sense that the only part that really scared me was co-parenting with somebody that I knew this wasn't really a good fit. Um, but I never doubted for a second that I wanted to have my son. Um, and um, and I, so as I was saying to you earlier, Dr. Jacqueline, uh, where I'm working now at this time, St. Mary's Home and Outreach Center is for yeah, young young families and young pregnant women. Um, I reached out to this center and, and I, I joined a couple of prenatal classes and other support groups and stuff and found a really good community here and was able to work more on my self-esteem. I still wasn't dealing with the past trauma of the rape and how it affected me. Um, but. I dealt with, okay, the realities of, okay, I have a child now, I'm responsible of another human being, I need to get my stuff together. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, I did that and uh, my son just turned 19 a couple of months ago, which is crazy to me, <laughs> but he's doing very, very well and I couldn't be prouder of him. We have a really great relationship. And um, yeah, and so uh, I got married about a, a, a couple of years later. Yeah, two years later, I met my now husband We'll be married 17 years this year, and we had a daughter very shortly after. So I have a 16-year-old daughter as well that I'm massively proud of. And um, but even throughout all of that, it was it was it was almost a constant struggle, especially for the first you know 10 to 12 years trying to figure out who am I and how to value myself. It was very hard for my husband or for me to let my husband to value me and show me the you know the kind of love and and affection and and uh, support that he wanted to because I didn't even know how to accept it. Um, and so uh, it took a lot of soul searching, a lot of hard work, and, um, but I've done a lot of it. There's, it's, a, it's, it's a continuous journey. I don't think you're ever cured or you're now you're fine and it's never going to bother you or come up again. It still does. Um, you know, my past oh my issues... God. Um, even the anger at myself for not dealing with it better, all those kinds of things. But now that sorry, my kids are older, oh, sorry, am I going off the <laughs> Sorry, just um, so um, I remember I was in Japan and uh, I was with a friend who, who is a top um, uh, teacher in, in the dance world. And okay. uh, we were just chatting and I, I, I you know, we're, we're just friends, it was not, nothing else. And I said, mm -hmm. I don't mean to be really personal, but have you been raped? And she said, no, I've never been raped. Look, why would you even bring this up? Mm. And the next uh, morning she was crying on my, t uh, uh, you know, on the phone and she said, no, I actually I was. And she had suppressed it so deeply because it was actually a family member that had done it. and. And uh, she, she then phoned up her sisters and, and the same thing had happened to them. But it, it had all been buried because, because it was a family member and so on. And, and it sounds like not only have you been through it, but you've also, you're also working with other women to get through it. And, and the first thing I, I want to ask about, it's kind of, it's almost ironic you were in, in Les Miserables because as Cosette, there's that, that amazing song, you know, On My Own. Uh, yes, and and it's a, and and I'm just want to start there. I, I'm guessing you felt very lonely because this was something that you didn't share with people, and and that was that there's that internal fight plus your empathic abilities. How how lonely is it that people feel when they're going through that? Um, yeah, it's it's intolerably lonely. Um, I I think for so many years though. Um, I never denied that I was raped. It was never repressed to the point where I didn't recognize it. But for the first, I don't know how long, maybe a couple of years, three years, it was very much just like there was confusion about whose fault it was. I mean, that's very common with, with victims of sexual assault or survivors. They, they often take a lot of the responsibility on themselves. 
And I mean, that's been perpetuated in our culture and society for years, right? You know, what were you wearing? Did you have anything to drink? And where did you meet them? And, and that kind of stuff. Now, it wasn't a situation like that. Mine was not a stranger situation. I did I did know the, the, well, the man. He was significantly older than me. Um, um, so that's not that that was not the situation but it was just i think it's even your brain does that to protect you to protect yourself right it's just to go like i'm going to rationalize this that it was it was love and it was just a heat of passion and this kind of stuff so for the first few years that's where my brain was and then later on because of all the stigma and awful um way women are treated around that sort of um experience and and situation i kind of just you know um pooed it. It was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. I was raped. So what? So it was like every, probably every other girl I know, at least 50% of them, if not more, you know? Um, so I hadn't even really acknowledged uh, emotionally, especially what had happened to me. And honestly, it was probably, um, it, was, it was when I was 35, I want to say, 34, 35 years old. So just about four or five years ago that um, I decided, like I was in therapy again, I had a really fantastic counselor and she was like, you know what, maybe you should just start writing it down. Cause a lot of the um, details were very jumbled in my brain. Like I still to this day can't remember what day it happened and exactly where I was. Like I could drive into the neighborhood but I couldn't tell you what house it was, you know, kind of stuff. And so I started writing almost like a memoir and I actually ended up writing about four or five chapters um, and it was a really cathartic experience because I was able to write about, well, like, this is how it led to it, which I felt was important because I was dealing with the, the trauma and the background of how did I get to a point where I blamed myself and I had responsibility for this. And then, and also, I mean, people in my life were very confused. My, my mother especially was very like, how could this have happened? How could I have not known? Like, you know, I didn't let you just go out and do whatever you wanted. Like. You know, so a lot of it was writing in terms so that she could also read it and understand that you bear no responsibility for this either. And then writing about the actual rape itself was very cathartic because some details did start and get start coming back to me. Um, it was a very difficult process and I'm very thankful my husband was wonderfully supportive and so was my family in terms of dealing with even my children. I told my children what I was doing so that they were aware of why I was so up and down and having some really rough days and stuff. But it was very cathartic and it was very difficult. But it was, I mean, my point to that is that it was 22 years later, 22 years it took me to finally be able to say, okay, I gotta acknowledge this. I gotta really process what happened and what effect it had before me. And I also had to be willing to say goodbye to the girl and the life that I thought I should have had, had it never happened to me, which is wow. very lonely because unless you've been through it, nobody can understand it. Nobody can understand that. My husband had a very difficult time understanding that as well as did my father. A lot of the men in my life, actually, um, women tend to have a bit more understanding because I think they have more um, experience, whether it's themselves or a friend or someone they love has also been through it. But yeah, so it's very lonely, very isolating, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> No, I, 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 you know, obviously I, I wouldn't understand. In May I? Sorry, yes, of course. Yes, uh, Becky, first of all, thank you for your transparency and for sharing something that's obviously so personal. I can relate to it because it did happen to me and I told one person and that person said that it was my fault. And anyway, you know, shouldn't have been there, shouldn't have been doing that. And so I've yeah. always been in dysfunctional relationships with men. And uh, I didn't talk about it probably until six months ago. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy how our brains do that because they want to protect us, but it's not actually protecting us, you know. And, um, and, that, and I totally feel you too. I mean, people don't know how to react to it. It's still very uncomfortable. I'm, I'm very comfortable talking about what happened to me what led to it, what happened, and how I've been dealing with it over the last, you know, 20 odd years, however long, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable about it, but it's funny, other people are not, they don't know how to deal with it. It's gotten a lot better, in the, in the, especially in most recent years with the Me Too movement, and a lot of women coming forward and people supporting them better. But yeah, I mean, when I first told my mother, and I, you know, I don't want to speak ill of her in any way, I, my mother is one of the greatest women I know, 
and I love her and I have so much respect for her, but her reaction was so hurtful only because she didn't know how to react to it either. Because the immediate reaction people have is their own feelings about it. It's not about, it's very hard for us to listen to somebody and then take our own baggage, our own beliefs, our own traumas even, and not allow that affect our response. And so, you know, my mother, unfortunately, she said something that she didn't mean to that was very hurtful when I told her. Um, we've dealt with it and it's totally fine. Um, but it's the same thing. I mean, I remember when I told the first boyfriend that I actually consented to having intercourse with, you know, it was very difficult for me. It didn't go very well. It wasn't that picture perfect, you know, candles and oh, we're so in love kind of thing. And so I had a lot of difficulty after and he was asking me what's wrong. Why are you so upset? We should be happy. And I confided in him that I was raped and his reaction was, oh, you mean I wasn't your first? Mm. Like really? Yeah. <laughs> like, so, so I actually was going to go there with the reactions and how people almost in our society, I think it's changing a lot, but would blame the, 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 the lady. There's, there's been a number of court cases where, where even the judge has blamed the woman for something she, it had nothing to do with her. It was purely the, the guys um, uh, who had committed uh, that, that uh, really that horrible horrible i'm really sorry it's it's like your entire life becky even even the uh, the because i did actually have a look at your imdb as well and it was goosebumps <laughs> right and all those kind of yeah. horror things that you were in it was like like your your life on my own from like miss rob was always almost uh, sharing your story without without you sharing the the, the story mm -hmm. how you were feeling inside i i, mm -hmm. I would say there's a there's a, a couple who divorced because their child had been raped and the reason they divorced was the, her, the 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 daughter's dad felt so bad about how he'd not been able to protect his daughter that he 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 spiraled and and couldn't get it together you know he was depressed about his job and and, and so on so I, I was also wondering how how it impacted the people around you because I'm guessing they went through what you went, first of all, through denial as well. And was it you, Becky, and then realizing it wasn't you? And why weren't they there to protect you? And what, what was it that stopped the, um, you from actually confiding in them? Because they hadn't created a, that safe space for you to talk. Yeah, I mean, for the, like I said, for the first long while, it, it, uh, even if somebody had created a safe space, I probably wouldn't even have admitted it. It was just so... I, I didn't want that to be real. I didn't want it to be a thing that actually had happened to me, um, especially since I felt responsible, you know, so I was just internally angry at myself for allowing it to happen. Um, truth be told, other than my mom's reaction, I, I don't really remember. Um, I, I don't remember when I told my family the first time. I remember my mother because, like I said, it was very jarring. <laughs> um, my father, I feel like I, I want to say that it was a similar reaction to when I told him I was pregnant in 19. It was just him sitting in his chair, rocking back and forth and repeating expletives that I can't say on air, <laughs> you know, because um, he was just really upset. Um, but no, he was very good at if he if he felt shame or as though he had um, failed in any shape or form as a father, he, he never put that on me. And I'm very grateful for him or to him for that. You know, um, my brother and I, I don't remember ever actually having a conversation. He was aware, but I don't ever remember going into detail about it. Even my husband, um, for the first several years of our marriage, he was always aware of it. I told him very early on. Um, but for the first several years of our marriage, he didn't want to talk about it at all. He didn't, he didn't want to hear details. He didn't want to know. He didn't, you know, because it made him uncomfortable. And for that duration of time I was like okay like I understand it's it's not a nice thing you want to know about your wife or somebody you care about but then after you know some therapy and, and self um, reflection and trying to figure out how to navigate finding myself into a healthier balance of emotional health and well-being you know I finally had to tell him like listen I know this makes you uncomfortable but it's a part of me so if you don't want to know this about me you're denying a part of me and that and that that's not okay in a, in a healthy relationship and after we navigated that area he was much more open to it and, and he's he's very good with it um my, my sisters were very supportive um my younger sister was as supportive as she can be um we live uh, she lives in LA on the west coast so I haven't 
we don't see each other very often, but she's always been very supportive if I've ever been triggered and had to talk about it. Um, my older sister even more so because unfortunately she she had a similar type of experience. I don't want to divulge too much, but um, you know she could relate to it in a way, and so we were able to really support each other through that, which was really great. Right. Um, I've got a number of things that people, from from what you've said, if I can recap that, perhaps, uh, um, Dr. Jacqueline, I don't know whether you want to do the sponsor break. Uh, yes, now. thank then you. When I come in, uh, and then we'll carry on with uh, Becky's journey. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're going to take a break and hear from some of our sponsors. We'll be right back. And our guest is Becky from Canada. Hey everybody, my name is Ralph Graves Jr. I'm the host of the Ralph Graves Jr. Show, and I want to invite you to pick up my book, Unstoppable. I wrote a book called Unstoppable. It's, it's seven universal laws that will transform how you pursue and achieve success. The one thing that my 20 years of law enforcement has taught me is that no matter who you are, we are all governed by universal laws, like gravity. But in this book, we're going to talk about laws like the law of forgiveness, laws like the law of control, the law of intelligent practice, the law of expectancy. I was able to see how those, no matter what their background was, those who, who identified and, and treated these laws with respect, they were able to go on and lead successful lives. So pick up this book and you can go ahead and pick it up at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, RalphGravesJr.com, where, um, anywhere where fine books are sold. Thank you. There are 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth today. 40% of these people are under the age of 25. Young adults are the most fertile mission field in the world today. In scripture, we see Jesus pouring his life into 12 young adults who he equipped to change the world and all of history. Like Jesus, we believe that the best approach to reach the world with the gospel is to invest in young emerging leaders and equip them to build disciple-making movements. Concentric is the notion of surrounding and sharing a common center. Our center is the model and strategy of Jesus for both leadership development and ministry formation. As a global alliance, we provide equipping in biblical leadership based on Jesus' example in the New Testament. Jesus modeled for us how to make disciples that reproduce. Focusing on leadership development is key to creating movements that spread the gospel and Jesus' disciple-making strategy to young leaders around the globe. Our Ministry Alliance partners are actively equipping leaders and building movements of multiplication that reproduce the life of Christ. Join us today to equip young leaders with Jesus' strategy that will change cities and nations. The session that we had with BCAT was really entertaining and enlightening. We were able to put together some very specific steps that we as individuals can take and it was really fun to all come together and see sort of where we're going as a team and how we can all get there together. We had a tremendous experience with the BCAT partners. One of the challenges that we have as an organization is to make sure that we have the right people in the right chairs doing the right thing. To do that well, you have to have synergy. You can try to dream up ways to make sure that your group does that, or you can rely on experts. We would recommend be a partner to anybody who's looking to take their organization to the next level. Academy Sedan and Limo is a full service transportation company serving the Philadelphia metropolitan area with full knowledge of the New York City, Baltimore and Washington DC areas. We pride ourselves on being the most dependable conscientious company in the industry. Our always on time service and dependable pricing make us the company to call for any event or occasion. Our vehicles can accommodate any size party for any occasion. Our vehicles range from four door sedans to SUVs to minivans to limo buses to full-size tour buses and can accommodate groups of two to 100. We offer airport shuttle service or over-the-road service without limitation regarding mileage or time and no drive is too long or too far. So if you find yourself in need of transportation of any type with any vehicle, give us a call at 610-842-4564 and let us show you what a real transportation company can do for you. Use code ACADEMY2020 to receive 20% off your first three rides, including parking and tolls.
You're listening to Business Talk Radio, where we take business to the next level. Uh, Hello. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline, the underdog show with my co-host, Mr. Ben Chai, and our wonderful guest, Becky from Canada. Becky is an empath. She's also a creative, a screenwriter, a poet, and she just shared something very personal that she is a survivor of rape and she is not a victim. She is an advocate for bringing more awareness to this the stigma of being raped and it's your fault and you shouldn't have been there you shouldn't have done that and how she's kept all that information in for so many years and finally decided that was enough and so now she's out there changing the world so thank you becky thank you becky this is the the underdog show where we share the stories the real life stories of people who've gone through challenges that either they themselves wouldn't thought they would never recover from or society has thought that they would never go beyond whatever it is that's holding them back. And Becky has been very authentic and vulnerable to share uh, something that happened to her when she was 13. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the whole issue of rape, uh, Becky, uh, you're, you're probably not aware, but I've been adopted by a number of women's groups where women have gone through domestic violence and many uh, uh, of the people there have not only gone through domestic violence, have been through rape. And one of the uh, the ladies who, who I'm her adopted father, so she's my daughter, her <laughs> job is actually uh, to deal with uh, young girls, probably around your age, who have been not just been raped once, but multiply raped. Um, so it's a very, very sad um, and challenging job. Now, from what I've heard from your story, one of the, the, the challenges that you have to overcome is not attracting um, and being in dysfunctional relationships and not attract uh, and attracting the wrong people. And I've seen that quite a bit with friends and people I've worked with who have been raped. They're constantly with the wrong people because in their hearts, they, they, they as you said, they rationalize it and they, 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 their self-esteem is so low now that they think that that's what they unconsciously, not consciously, deserve. Nobody wants to be raped, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. it sounds like three things that you've done for your journey out of that, which has taken you, you know, several decades to, to work through, is one, you, you found somebody, I think it was a, a therapist, to, to help you work through uh, some of the issues that have been holding you back and, and preventing you from being the wonderful, amazing person that you are. The second thing is you, you, you wrote a journal. So you, you wrote things down to try and get all that anger out of you and, and, and also go through the scenarios. I'm, I'm guessing that the, your journal covers a lot more than that and perhaps we can cover that in a second. And the third thing you did is you worked with someone to go through those events. So rather than rationalizing it in your own head, you've had someone piece together what really happened. Would, would those yeah. three be correct in summarizing some of the, the, the gems and insights you're, you're sharing to help other uh, people who've gone through rape to, to, to kind of work their way out of it? Of that self, self, um, lack of self-worth. Sorry, Becky. That's okay. Yeah, no. Um that's absolutely absolutely all very good points that you make up on good uh, <laughs> and uh, good points that you make and those are definitely um, things that can help a person I, I think I mean this is this is all from my personal experience I'm not a professional in any way I, and I don't want ever any anybody to ever get confused about that um, but in terms of the therapist it, it's a mix of more than just that it's like I saw many over several years sometimes they were good fits sometimes they weren't um, you know, I've, I've even heard of, of, of individuals who've gone and had very negative experience and that makes them never want to go back into some sort of therapy. Um, so, you know, my, my suggestion would be to, to just keep trying different forms of it too, whether it's support groups, whether it's a crisis line, whether it's um, an actual one-on-one. -on -one. The one that I ended up connecting with best and getting uh, the most help from um, one point about that is she was actually um, a student at the time that I found her. So this, this the local university that has a, a counseling program. I couldn't afford 
um, uh, you know, therapy. I couldn't afford a psychologist. It's very expensive and it's not covered under a lot of, uh, even here in Canada where we have um, uh, free healthcare, we do, <laughs> but it doesn't cover everything. And so I couldn't afford the very, you know, expensive and, and, and worthwhile ones as they call them. So I went and, and I spoke to this program and they said, well, we have students, it's, it's supervised, they videotape everything and there's a, their professor goes over the videotapes with them and helps guide them where to go and stuff. But that ended up being the one that was the best fit for me. I ended up staying with her even longer after she graduated for, for a little while longer. But the other side of that coin too is I had to be ready for it. So even at times when you know I did have a therapist and it didn't work, it necessarily wasn't it wasn't necessarily the therapist's fault. It was also that I wasn't ready for it, not consciously. I wasn't going in and refusing to talk about things. I mean, a therapist only knows what to ask if you divulge information. You know, um, I mean, it's just the same thing in a marriage. You can ask your husband or your wife or your partner to go, please go to therapy. You know, clearly we're having issues. But if they don't actually open up to that therapist, they can't do anything. Um, or at least it's very challenging. <laughs> so to that point, yes, uh, therapy was a big part of it, but it, but it was a very long journey. So, you know, uh, a person who's been sexually assaulted or raped, going right into therapy right after may not be a good, good idea. It may not be a good fit for them. It's a long journey. There is no right way to respond to someone who comes and says, hey, I've been raped, what should I do? There are a million options that need to be put forward and they have to be comfortable with what's next because the biggest key is they've been violated and they've been um, completely put off their, you know, what path they thought they were going to take um, out of their, you know, against their will. Um, you know, they've lost all their power. And so you have to let them to decide what their journey is. And unfortunately, it's going to be a long one. I, I, I never met one who's like immediately after, oh, I'm going into therapy and I'm going to this. It's very difficult. Um, so that's the therapy part of it. As for journaling, that was a, a, a I've always loved writing. So for me, it made sense to, to write. It really helped because a lot of the anger that I was holding on to for a very long time, um, I projected it as angry at other people. I was angry at my mom and dad for not protecting, for not knowing how could they not figure it out. I was mad at the world for you know making me feel like it was my fault. I was mad at boyfriends for not responding in a caring way. I was mad at friends. I was mad at so many other people. But then journaling it and, and, and writing it out, and I did it as a stream of consciousness, not as like a, well, I'll write about this and erasing and editing while I was doing it. It was just very right, 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 right. No thoughts, no stopping myself. Um, you know, doing that was very cathartic for me um, and it just made sense, you know, and through that I was able to realize that all the anger I was projecting out to other people, I, I was actually mad at myself and that was the breakthrough for me. I, I, I never believed it. I never thought I was actually mad at myself. I really believed when my brain was telling me, no, you're mad at them because they did this and you're mad at the world because of this and you're mad that you know, you didn't get that part and you're mad that you didn't get paid for that gig and you're mad, you know, and so it really helped me sort out that I was projecting my anger out in a very unhealthy and meaningless way. Only, it was only meaningful in the sense that I felt like I was protecting myself, but um, writing it out and figuring all that stuff out, I realized I was angry at myself. Um, and that was a huge breaking point for me in terms of really working out the issues and, and being able to move forward in a positive way. Right. But, but that, that, still doesn't, that still doesn't, um, so understanding that you were angry with yourself still doesn't mean that the person did not violate you. I, I just want to get this very no. straight because they still violate okay. you. How you okay. deal with your internal reactions, because we know the anger and, and the unforgiveness internally of not, I'm not even talking about the person. I'm not the person. I'm talking about the forgiveness of yourself. Uh, yeah, will eat absolutely. Up you. absolutely. And actually, it was funny when we went to the commercial break, that law commercial, the first one, he said, not just the law of gravity, the law of forgiveness. forgiveness. And I actually wrote that down because that's such a key part of it. And people think forgiveness is really hard and it's next to impossible. Like, I could never forgive this person for betraying me. I could never forgive. But it's actually forgiveness of self that is the most important and valuable in my experience um, 
journey that I've had to go on, especially in this. I mean, logically, I always knew it was not my fault what happened. Um, you know, even though I I did show this this person of interest that I was interested in, even though I did kind of flirt with him, even though I did disappear at parties with him every once in a while, that doesn't make it my responsibility what happened. Um, and, uh, you know, and even further to that, being angry at the world and making poor choices moving on from that for several years, I was angry about that. Why did I, why did I spend time with boys who were so unkind to me? Why did I ally myself with men that were abusive and cheated on me. Why did I do that? What, what is wrong with me? I internalized it all. Like there was something wrong with me. And uh, it, it took a lot of, of hours. <laughs> you were 13. <laughs> takes... You were 13. How yes, would you this know? Continued, yes, How this would continued you know? For several years, for sure. And I, I completely agree with you, but this continued into my adulthood. Right. Can, I mean, my relationship even with my husband Thankfully, he's a wonderful human being, and we've worked through it together. But even in the early years, it was it was toxic, not in terms of violence or abuse or anything like that. But I I, I couldn't be in a healthy relationship. I didn't know. I, I you know when he, he you know even sexually. I hope he's not going to be mad at me for this. <laughs> but even sexually, you know, it was never an issue of attraction. But like you know, if he he was tired that day, I would get mad because I felt like, well, what do you mean? That's what love is. That's what that's how I know you want me and that's how we're okay, you know? And so, I mean, that was extremely unhealthy. It took me years to unlearn that and to be like, no, it's okay. He can, he can be not in the mood, just like I can be not in the mood, but, but I did it both ways. I was mad at him when he wouldn't be in the mood. And then if I wasn't, I felt guilty. And I was like, oh my God, if, if I do this, is he gonna be mad at me? Does it mean there's something wrong with our marriage? You know, and so I would do it and then I would feel worse because I felt like, oh, I was kind of forced, even though it was never forced, I forced myself. So, you know, those types of things just perpetuate for years and years. So yes, I was 13. Yes, it was uh, that immediate trauma just shifted my entire brain so that for the next 22 or more years plus now, I I didn't understand healthy relationships and I, and I internalized it all. Anytime anybody was un, uh, unhappy with me or upset, it was completely my fault and I did something wrong. Becky, I'm, I'm over here shaking my head because so many of the things that you said I can completely relate to and it's such a long, painful journey that other people really can't understand and there's still, at least in my, my feeling, you feel dirty, you feel unloved, you feel not good enough, but you've done the work. So congratulations to you. And I know it's an evolution. I know sometimes that ideas pop up into your head or memories, but for the rest of our audience out there, who's not as far as you are, maybe they're still on their journey. What would you share with them about what it takes to get through this? Um, absolutely. Um, well, again, forgiveness. Self-forgiveness is a huge part and, and, and being kind to yourself and having patience. It's a it's going to be a very long journey. Every, anything worth doing is is hard, is challenging, is it takes a long time. You know, it, it's very rare that things happen overnight. And if they do, it's 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 fleeting. You know, so I think patience, uh, forgiveness and being kind because um i mean i would also hold myself to a higher standard than i did anybody else in my life you know the way people treated me the way people spoke to me or the way people made me feel um i i i did nothing you know to to, to what's the word i'm looking for sorry to help myself through that and i wouldn't i would never do that to anybody else so why is it okay for them to do it to me um, you know, and that's and that's very hard, especially as a woman, I feel, because women, I mean, at least from my childhood, I remember all the roles that I saw in movies and television and the way it was perpetuated and, and, and it was socialized and nurtured by society is, you know, sh sugar and spice and everything nice and make everybody feel good all the time and you don't want people to be unhappy. And, and I really internalized that. And so I sacrificed myself for other people all the time. Uh, it, it took a long time for me to unlearn that. So forgiveness, patience, and kindness to yourself. Um, patience on the journey. It takes one step at a time. And and don't, goals are not a bad thing. It's definitely not a bad thing to say like, okay, 
I would like to get here and I'm here right now, but don't put timelines on it. Don't say, okay, by this time next year or by the time I'm 25 or 35 or 45, I wanna be here. Because then you're worried about your progress of getting there rather than actually learning from the progress and the process and the journey. And, and I thought I, that's what I found for myself. I remember somebody shared on social media the other day, they said, you know, there's two ways of looking at a project. They said, you can, you know, when you're doing the project, you can just like, like people in jail, you know, in movies, you would see they put like a, a line on the wall for every day that they've done, that have been in jail. And then they just keep looking back and going, oh my God, look how long I've been doing this. Look how long I've been here. Whereas this person suggested, and I wish I could give them a shout out, but I can't remember. I think it's Off Hours Creative on Instagram. But anyways, um, uh, this person was saying every day, just do one thing, just one thing towards your goal. You know, so like if, if, if it's, I want to write a song soon, like, and I say, I give myself a goal. I want to write a new song by next Friday or something like that. You know, don't think about how am I going to get there? Just think about, okay, today I am going to pick up my guitar and I'm going to play it. And then just then put a line or an X or a check mark or a heart, a star, whatever you want to do, you know, on that day on the calendar. And then the next day, do one thing again. And then what you do is when, when you're looking at the progress, you're looking at, oh, this is what I've done. Not, oh, how long have I been? But like, this is what I've accomplished. And it's the same thing with my journey in terms of my, my mental health and, and bettering myself and self-loving and self-care. It was just like, okay, what can I do today that will help contribute to me becoming a better me? You know, and, and that's just, that's all I can say. And just don't be afraid to, you're gonna, you're gonna have to shut some people out. You're going to have to. There are gonna be people who either just can't take it. And I've had to do this with people I love, you know, and I've just had to say, hey, love you, take care. And I talk to them once a year or when I see them at gatherings every once in a while, pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, um, but there are gonna be people you're gonna have to not necessarily cut off and say, I never wanna talk to them again, but just, distance yourself in a healthy way. And those who really do care and love you, they'll come back, they will. They'll be like, hey, like I haven't talked to you as much. Why is that? What's going on? So setting boundaries, you know, healthy boundaries was a huge part of this journey as well. So yeah, forgiveness, kindness to yourself, patience on the journey. Um, keep looking at the positives of what you're doing and the steps you're taking. Don't look back at how long it's taking you or why you got here in the first place just keep thinking about the good things you can do for yourself and and learning healthy boundaries those are the key things that i would suggest and wish to impart on even my a younger self of me yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so there so, um sorry dr j yes i was going to say they're really great suggestions and i i want to add one thing and have you comment on it and again i am not a licensed therapist i'm not a healthcare provider but also I, i'm a huge advocate of uh, law and rsvu i watch the show all the time I love it. and one thing yeah. love it. one thing that comes up all the time is it doesn't matter how you look it doesn't matter how you're dressed what you're wearing how you act mm -hmm. you have the right to say no and if somebody Absolutely. disrespects that, they've crossed the line and they are abusing, taking advantage. So I, I just know from myself that people are always like, oh, look at the way you're dressed. Well, it doesn't matter how I'm dressed, okay? Nope. It doesn't matter. So I just want to get that point across and have you weigh in on that. Absolutely, I 100% I agree. I, I remember when my daughter was just, she's just coming out of her childhood and into starting to look like a young woman and uh she herself was struggling with it she was just very much like oh no i'm just gonna wear my sports bras and my and my sports gear she's also a very athletic girl um but she was very uncomfortable with how her body was changing and i was very much like no i'm, I'm not gonna let this happen and i took her shopping and for the first two hours we pretty much fought the whole time <laughs> because she wanted to do these things and i was like no and then finally i made her go into a store with me i grabbed you know um what people would call flattering clothes for a female body you know she's and she's, she's a beautiful girl she's tall she's got a nice long torso you know this kind of thing so i got her some like you know cut off like belly tops things and and nice shorts and stuff and i said go in there and try this on and she's like no i don't want to and i said go just try it on if you hate it oh well we wasted three hours of our lives 
anyways and she came out and she was very you know she was like oh i don't, I don't know and, and just like going like this and i finally just grabbed her by the shoulders and i forced her in front of the mirror and i said look at yourself i said look at you you are a beautiful girl you have a lovely shape and body and face and also your lovely personality and amazing person why aren't you enjoying that why aren't you loving that about you you know and she just kind of was like uh, I, I don't know what to say and i was like this is reality this is who you are and you need to love every part of you and there's nothing wrong with this and she actually teared up a little bit and was like mom i'm not a little girl anymore and i was like no you're not you're becoming a woman and further to that my husband was away that weekend when he came back i had texted him and said i went shopping with our daughter don't freak out <laughs> and he was like okay but when he came home i told her go put on the clothes and show dad what we bought. And he came into the room and I said to him, I said, do not be a jerk. <laughs> do not overreact. And so she came out, wore the clothing and she was like, look, yay. And he was just like, oh yeah, it looks nice. And I could see it right away. I could see the wheels going like, oh my God, she's showing her legs, she's showing her midriff. What kind of attention is she drawing? What kind of things are people gonna be thinking about her? And she left the room. I didn't say anything right away, but later that night, he brought it up and I said to him, I said, no, don't go there. That's you bringing that into the conversation because that's not why she's doing it. She's doing it because she feels good about who she is and she should feel good about who she is and how she looks and feel comfortable in her body. You're the one bringing that baggage in. And we went to bed kind of angry at each other that day, <laughs> that night. But the next day he came back and was like, you know what? You're hundred percent right. And that's the truth. That's the truth of the matter. You know, she's a beautiful girl. People are going to look at her. She has a right to feel beautiful in her body, but it is not on her how other people treat her or react to what she's presenting to the world. May, so may I, I have to say your husband you. a little bit, Becky? Sorry? <laughs> may I defend your husband a tiny bit, just a little tiny bit? Of because we, yeah. we, are, we do have this kind of protective mentality in our heads yeah and it isn't because that he didn't want her to show the world how wonderful and beautiful she is it's more his head thinking oh i need to protect my daughter and if something happens because some guy idiot doesn't understand you know mm -hmm. boundaries yeah, and yeah. The word no that so that's what's going in his head not that he doesn't oh, want to, to I see think, how yes yeah. Sorry, I was I was just saying I totally understand where it comes from. And especially no, since I'm I, trying to be jerks. <laughs> I, no, absolutely. I understand that. I mean it, it's very logical as well as that's what's perpetuated in television movies, right? The good old dad with the baseball bat whenever the daughter brings the boy home. And I totally get that. But I would rather he contribute to raising her so that she can withhold her own healthy boundaries and when she does get treated certain ways, she can stay st stand and say no. I mean Hopefully, I mean, that doesn't, I mean, obviously I would never want anything physically to happen to her. I would never want her to be in a situation where she feels um, objectified or sexualized and that kind of thing. But I can tell you that having that reaction from your own dad, even if it does have good intentions, it's creepy. You feel like your own dad is sexualizing you and it makes mm -hmm. you feel worse than mm -hmm. if a stranger looks at you and goes like, hey baby, you look great. You know, it's yeah. worse. <laughs> So I get the logic, I 100% do. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. J, do you want to have our last um, uh, commercial break? And, and Becky, one of the things I'd, I'd like to ask about is, you know, there's, there's this part of you that is an empath and there's a part of you who, who tries to rationalize things. Uh, and there was a part of you that was pushing good people away because of what had happened to you and attracting bad people. So what I'm interested in, if you like, in the last aspect of this uh, um, interview is how do you know what is rationalizing bad behavior and how do you stop yourself from pushing good behavior because now it's you it, it, it's not you anymore it's you thinking you don't deserve good people if you see what i mean so you're pushing them away and they haven't it's not bad behavior but you're also rationalizing bad behavior is good behavior yeah, is, is that all right, Dr. J? We don't have time for a break, so we'll just go right into right. it. We want to say hello to, uh, I hope I'm saying your name right, Gosia Castle. Uh, go, Becky. 
Oh, Gasha, I'm sorry, Gasha. Go, Becky, you're amazing. Yay. And we also have uh, Fraser Ramsey. Hey, this is from the beginning of the show. So, uh, so thank you. So, Becky, why don't we just go right into it the last few minutes of our program? Sure. Um, so, I just want to confirm and make sure I understand. You're asking me that before I used to push good people away because I didn't think I was worthy of it. And then now, how do I know? whether it's true good behavior or like healthy or not? Is that what you're yes, asking that's right, because We're also rationalizing bad behavior and trying to think, no, no, it's not them. It's kind of me, you know, and, and, and you, you, you were dealing with societal norms of trying to please everybody and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. how, how do you now uh, distinguish between, no, this is a violation of my boundary and actually, and, okay. and then there's another behavior where you don't feel you deserve it, so you're pushing them away, but they haven't done anything wrong. Gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, so healthy boundaries was a very um, challenging thing throughout my whole life. I, I did not learn them as a child, unfortunately. Um, my mom and dad, I'm sure, tried very hard to, to teach and impart that on us, but it, it didn't take, or they, uh, they themselves struggle with it even to this day, so. Um, yeah, that's, it, it, I mean, no one can ever know for sure when someone comes into their life, whether it's a new person or someone they've known a long time, that their, their intentions are always good, right? Uh, I, I am very much of the mind as an empath, especially. Um, I always, I default to everybody is good and kind until they're not, um, you know, and, and because of that, um, I think that contributed to my issues with, with healthy boundaries and relationships as I was growing up. Um, but honestly, the, the, thing, the way I navigate things now is just very open communication. Um, and I try to, you know, emotions are really integral as humans, um, especially uh, ones that we, we call negative, like anger, sadness, frustration, all of those things. They're very important because they allow us or force us to put up a stop sign in front of our faces and go like, whoa, this is not okay. Whether it's, you know, a physical violation, a boundary violation, or you've hurt my feelings or offended me, all those things. It's really important that we acknowledge them and go, whoa, whoa, okay, I, I'm not okay. But with extensive self teaching, um, I, I, when I have those moments where I'm like feeling, whoa, whoa, this is not okay, I'm freaking out. I'm very good at just going like, okay, listen, like I, you know, I need to step out for a minute or, you know, um, I gotta, I gotta put a pause or put a pin in this so that we can come back to it later. Don't get me wrong. I'll still have, especially people I have a, a very, um, you know, intense relationship with. There will be moments where intense exchanges happen because you can't control yourself and blah, blah, blah. But that stop sign of, hey, you're really mad right now or you're really hurt. I really pay attention to it and I go, okay, I refuse to feed it though. I acknowledge that it's there and then I, I dig deep to find out why is it there because anger is just that. It's just it's just a warning. It's a mask for what's actually happening in my experience. So like when I would get angry at my husband for not cleaning the kitchen, there were underlying issues. It's not really about the kitchen. <laughs> you know, it's about him not not uh, following up on a promise that he made that he would do it or not respecting the fact that I asked him to do it or those kinds of things, you know? And so there's deeper issues. It's not just about the kitchen. And so it's the same thing with, with other things. If, if people start, if I feel like people are starting to cross a boundary, I really take inventory of why I feel that way. And then I communicate it as best I can. Um, I feel like because of the, the journey I've had and, and the work that I've done, I'm a fairly decent communicator about these things. And so more often than not, the conversations go fairly well. Um, but it does happen where some people are just, well, this is intense. Like, this is not what I meant. You're clearly misunderstanding me all the time. We can't be friends. And I just go, oh, oh okay, if that's how you feel about it, um, you know. But that's the biggest thing is emotions are such an important part of who we are. Um, and um, that's why I don't like terms like, you know, um, dramatic or, you know, those kinds of things or emotionally unstable. No, it's just that they need to learn that, yes, you have those emotions, but don't feed them. Take inventory of them and find what the underlying cause is for them kind of thing. You know, does that answer your question, Ben, or did I just go completely off topic? <laughs> 
No, no, I, I think you, I, I think you did very well in, in sharing the boundaries and you also having to think about before you reply to them, which is um, where they've broken a boundary and, and what is actually, they've, they're actually trying to reach out and, and be good to me. And, and now it's my own internal anger that's, that's pushing them away. And, and, and here's, so it's, it's great. Thank you so much. And honestly, thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shown, shared. There's some great, great gems and insights, which, you know, you. I'm sure will help many, many of our, our, our viewers. Well, thank you. And, and, and my goal now is now that I can focus on my music, a lot of my songs are about these, these issues. You know, I, I, I wrote a song recently called Nightmares of You, where I woke up after having nightmares of my rapist and then my family and, and friends not supporting me through that. And so I wrote a song about it. You know, I've written a song about issues I've had with my family dealing with trauma and that kind of stuff. And, and I've written a few songs about the, the positive sides because you got to focus on the positive, too. Um, but that's a big goal of mine is I, I, I really want to I want to create a community with my music who want to learn and hear and listen and and you know and I hope to reach them and help them through their journey as well so Becky may Be um, we, sorry Dr. J yes um, Becky I really admire you and I'm very proud of you and I'm so grateful oh, that you. you have come as far as you have and that you are spending every day of your life trying to help other people because as you just shared it is a very difficult journey one that's very emotional one that's very isolating and very lonely and I love the fact that you found this outlet for you to be able to work through the pain and help other people at the same time for people who are um, thank you for people who cannot read the banner who are on the radio listening what's the best way that people can get in touch with you and also support your work um, yeah the best way right now is Instagram I didn't want to overwhelm myself with too much social media because I'm not actually a huge fan of online it's uh, it makes me uncomfortable because it's people behind a screen and I can't see their authentic selves um, but I'm branching out and I just started really pushing on my Instagram over the last several months I'm posting my music up there, and uh, and I just uh, hired a wonderful um, company, Covilla Design, and they're helping me learn about branding and how to really get my stuff out there in a meaningful way. It's not about getting a gajillion followers and a record label, and it's really about connecting with people. My music is the way I connect. So at Becky Sings is uh, is the best way on Instagram. Uh, you can message me, follow me, all that kind of stuff. I'd love to support and I'd love to hear stories that help influence my journey and influence my music as well. But I also do have a, a, a website where I share some of my art, my art and uh, stories and poems and lyrics. It's at uh, www.pieceofash, peace as in, you know, the peace sign, like peace dude, like the, the hippies back in the day, <laughs> peace of ash. And um, yeah, and, and like I said, Instagram for sure. And uh, I would appreciate any sort of shout out or anything like that, because I just love connecting with people. I really do. And I appreciate you guys so much for having me on. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Yes. And what I was Thank you, Zach. Say, say uh, Becky, as, as Dr. J also has a, another co-host, Deborah Wooten, who set up in on Facebook a group called the 529 Creatives. So they do mm. things like musical theater and acts and stuff. And I'd love you to join that group and share your music in that group because that allows me also to see your music and share it across my different platforms. So, so if you are a Facebook user, please, please join the group. Uh, and obviously we'll, we'll let you in the group and please share that music because I, I think I think what you're doing is so valuable uh, to society today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had Facebook sure. for many years and then I got off because I didn't feel safe on it. And the more and more I get into this, though, the more and more I hear I should get back on Facebook. So I, I'll do it eventually. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks again for Thank being here. Enjoy so, the rest so of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay bye, bye. Bye. Yes, bye. Too. Bye. Well, oh, she. Right. Yes. 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 Uh, she. She brought something to life that affects a lot of people who don't talk about it, and she delivered the information in such a vulnerable and authentic way, which is not something easy to do. So I really have the utmost respect for her, and I'm really glad that she was here today to share her story and help other people. 
yeah, uh, so many, so many, many great, great insights. And and uh, people, uh, if uh, and lovely audience, if you do find this helpful, or if you know of people or groups that are going through uh, uh, rape in some some way, please, please do share this episode of the Underdog Show with your group or friends, uh, for them to gain extra insights from from Becky Lantis's journey because we don't know if it helps just one person then uh you know this whole broadcast will, will have been worth it and the person might not even be watching right now it might be somebody who watches later so you can go to our youtube channel dr jacqueline llc and you can subscribe there and watch the show anytime you want so dr who thank you for being here and looking quite dapper and uh anything you'd like to leave our audience with today uh, yes, mental health is a big, big thing. And I, I know, uh, Dr. J, that you interviewed, um, I think it was uh, Adam and Kerry Duval on, on one of your shows. Uh, and uh, the whole to topic of rape that we, we discussed today massively impacts not just the person being raped, but the uh, family around, the, uh, around that person. So please, please, please um, be kind to other people. And, and really think about mental health and, and how you can help people around you to do uh, today have the best mental wellness. Well said, you never know what someone else is going through. And uh, I found myself, people sometimes are, they react or they, they're nasty for some reason and you have to take a breath and say, you know what, there's something behind that. You don't even know what it is. So just give them a pass, give them a pass be kind and you might make a big difference in their life just by showing that graciousness. With that, thank you That's again, it. Dr. J, for another wonderful episode. Thank you, Dr. Who of Business. I wish you a pleasant day in London and I'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you, audience. We have some other shows coming up today. The business talk show is coming up where our guest is Roger J. Moore. And then we have A Better You, lessons from the best coaches, consultants, and trusted advisors. And after that, we have In the Name of Love. So we are actually adding a new show, which is also going to be on Wednesdays. You're probably thinking, how could you possibly fit in another show? It's going to be starting at 1 o'clock Eastern time, which is 6 p.m. British summer time. And the name of the show is An Audience with Celebrity Psychic Gemma. This show is going to be a little bit different in that Gemma will not have any idea as a co-host who the guests are. We will not be posting anything on social media about who the guests are. And when the guests come on, they will come on after the show already starts. So if you want to have a reading, you will not be able to contact Gemma. You will not be able to publicize the fact that you're going to have a reading. And the reason for this is that Gemma is the real deal. She's authentic and she doesn't want any information about anyone so that she can truly show you how she channels spirit and provides readings. So you can go to our website, drjacqueline.com, book your session if you'd like to be a guest and have a reading. Thank you so much. We will see you at the top of the hour for our next show, The Business Talk Show, with my co-host, Mr. Al Sini, and our guest, Robert J. Moore. Mm -hmm.